Hi, um, my name is Emily Steinberg and I am a painter and a, uh, I create visual narratives. And I've been doing painting since I was about 18 and I've been doing visual narratives since I was 40. And ever since then I've been kind of writing and drawing and making narratives about sort of autobiographical narratives about um, stuff that's happening to me and really, really, really enjoying it. So um, when I got out of graduate school in about 1992, um, figuration was kind of not happening at all. And um, most people were doing what I call artist sociology. So it was kind of like identity art, um, art about, I don't even know what it was about. Um, and basically I just felt it felt to me that it was a, I had a hard time figuring out how, how I was going to do my work and, and kind of be in the art world. Um, figuration just was not kind of a thing that was happening, and emotion really was not a thing that was happening. And my paintings are really all about um, psychology, emotion, hum, uh, human humanity, um, and it just wasn't, there was no place for it. So... I came to a point in my painting where I kind of just didn't even understand what I was, why I was doing it anymore. It just felt really like I had hit a dead end. And that's why, um, you know, I decided maybe if I started to write and draw about stuff, I could kind of get that personal narrative into it, which is what all of my stories are about. It's, it's all autobio. And, um, that's kind of a way for me to tell my stories, basically. When I started making visual narratives, um, it came out of a period where, I, like, like I told you before, I really had stopped painting. And I was really just kind of writing and writing about my experiences, um, my day-to-day -day experiences, my thoughts, my psyche, the whole thing. And I put them together with images and came up with this book called Graphic Therapy, which is really about kind of my formative years as a young painter, what was going on, and somehow or other, I this the idea of doing autobio was really the thing that was interesting to me because it was about my reaction to um, my life, to the world, to what's going on. It was, for me, the personal reaction is interesting because it's so specific, right? And you can get these great specific details in there. Um, and so that's why I kind of work autobio. So I think that the working in visual narrative really freed me up in, term, in my painting. Um, I was drawing a ton with my stories and drawing and drawing and drawing and I became very free. I became very kind of um, emotional, expressive, emotive, kind of anything went. There was no rules. The rules were kind of thrown out the window. And... Um, so just the sheer volume of work that I was doing and the fact that it didn't seem to have as much, um, there was no kind of, um, there was no preciousness about it. For me, painting had become this kind of precious thing that had to be a certain way. And there was a freedom in visual narrative that kind of allowed me to make a lot of mistakes and explore and through the mistakes I kind of found my way and that's sort of how I've come back into painting um, bringing this sort of exploration adventure type feeling to it and not having any kind of nothing is wrong everything can work in a painting and then you just have to figure out you know if it's right for that painting I used to have a studio where I could have I had I have two of these big walls that have two uh, sides to them. And then I had lots of walls in the studio. So I actually had like six of these things going on at the same time, six of these giant paintings going on. And I actually really like that because um, if one gets stuck, you just move on to another one and you keep moving until something happens. Um, so my studio now is smaller and I can only have one of these walls with two sides, um, which kind of, you know, limits what I can do, but it also lets me focus a little bit more on kind of finishing one before I move on to the next one. Um, so in terms of painting and visual narrative, 
Um, editing is such an interesting process. And in, in the paintings, what happens is that, you know, I'm really interested with my paintings in, the, in that you can see the process of them happening. So I don't like to tie up loose ends. I like to let them sort of stay. I like to have the idea of the ghosted image in there. I like to have the layers of transparency. Um, I'm not interested in really making a finished, whatever a finished product is with my paintings. I'm interested in letting the viewer see a record of my thought process um, and allowing them to kind of fill in the blanks. And that's sort of how I go with my paintings. With my visual narratives, I get so involved with them and the editing can be so, um, you know, just really how do you place the text on the page next to the image? I mean, sometimes you just have to keep writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it to see how it works best and whatever. So in some ways, the editing in the visual narratives is a lot more intense than when I'm with my, with my paintings. Um, they, I, I take a lot of time with that. You know, it gets really, really kind of super, um, what's the word? Kind of super focused. But I like the idea in my paintings that, again, they are kind of a record of an experience. They are not, you know, they're a moving record in a way. So the paint, the big paintings, what they are for me is that they're life size. And I feel like I'm really kind of in a, I'm able to move, I'm able to kind of move around. It's kind of a very comfortable space for me to be in. Um, and I like that. I like playing with the space. Drawing small is fine. It just kind of works. It just, you know, it's kind of almost like doodling or sketching or whatever. And that actually works really well. Um, but I think what holds me for the paintings is the actual scale, um, which allows kind of a larger uh, experience, basically, a more life-size experience. So I used to be like this perceptual painter, and I was really interested in, like, for instance, that's what I was doing when I was an undergraduate at Penn. Outside, plein air, really just painting, getting into the whole thing, and I still love to really do that, but I find it limiting. I find, um, I find that the narrative thing is just a lot more interesting and open-ended for me rather than just painting exactly what I, not even exactly, but just painting what I see. It's just not as, it doesn't hold me as much. So I look at, I mean, in terms of painters, I am a, when I was in my, um, last year at school at Penn, I went to do a summer in Florence and we studied art history. And I became captivated by the Italian Renaissance painters. Um, I, you know, Michelangelo, and he was like my favorite, favorite, favorite person in the entire world. Giotto, um, loved the Italian painters. I love Picasso, I love Matisse. I love classical figurative painting. Um, I love narrative painting. Uh, there's of course, Philip Guston is my huge hero. And in terms of graphic narrative, who do I really love? I love the ones, I love people who are expressive. I'm not really interested in the kind of cartoon people. Um, I like people who are literally, typically artists who happen to be doing this, right? And they're kind of a different breed. I'm not really interested in, um, like I love Myra Kalman. I don't know if you know her, but she's an amazing um, words and image person. And she does these beautiful, um, beautiful paintings and then has this wonderful text on them. So I love her. Let's see, who else do I love? Um, I don't know really who else I love actually in visual narrative. She's kind of it. As I say, I teach, I'm a visual art visiting artist at Drexel College of Medicine, working in graphic medicine, working in kind of telling the stories of medical students in, um, in their experience in med school, right? Which is a kind of an amazingly intense um, format. Graphic medicine is a really interesting movement uh, and a group of people. And it started in Penn State with a group of professors 
and a couple of comics um, health care workers who got together and decided there would be it would be a really good idea to have health care um, providers sort of use comics as a way to kind of demystify the medical process and bring people into it that ordinarily might not be able to be brought into kind of talking about hard topics or talking about disease or talking about the experience of caregivers and patients um, and, and physicians, really. So um, I kind of got involved with them in 2016. I went to a conference in Dundee, Scotland and spoke about my um, experience with um, tr trying to have kids in a story that I wrote called Broken Eggs about infertility and that was really the way that I was able to process all of that was by doing this story. And that was really an amazing, an amazing process and a very healing process for me. And again, that is really what graphic medicine is all about, right? Is like writing out and drawing out your feelings so that it becomes something, you know, you've created something out of it. So that was a really good, that was a very positive thing for me, was creating that story. And it was an incredibly welcoming group of people. Uh, very, very, everyone was kind of very interested in hearing each other's stories. And, uh, but yeah, graphic medicine is a, is a growing field. There are many, many books talking about many different kind of types of disease or types of illnesses and have had a huge impact on um, people who are going through that kind of stuff. And it's a great way to feel that you're not alone going through kind of a very arduous or um, even life challenging situation. It's really helpful. Med students are, you know, type A personality, incredibly smart, very bright, very focused, wonderful intellectual kids, students. And, um, they work really, really hard at everything they do. And I was fortunate enough to have five or six of them last semester before COVID. And we decided to do a comic zine on their experiences in the anatomy lab um, working with cadavers. And they all happened to be extremely good writers and drawers. So the work that they created was, I, I was really blown away by it. I mean, just the sort of level of thoughtfulness, the level of um, sophistication they brought to it, the empathy they brought to it, the fact that they were, you know, very, very um, thankful to these, to the cadaver, basically, to, that they had given their body to science was just an amazing gift. So it was a really great experience for me. And I continue to work um, with the with them but this year it's been a little different because we haven't been together it's nicer to be able to get there in person and and work with the students what i teach my students is that you have to have it's an economy of language right you have to it's almost like poetry you have to severely edit down what you're trying to communicate and so you have to pick the right words you have to absolutely like edit down to get to the absolute essence of what it is you're trying to communicate and that's what i love about it like I love picking the right words. I love the crafting of the sentence or the two sentences that's going to be accompanying an, an image. It really is a marriage of words and images. And that's what I, I just love that. I think it's, it's fun. I mean, each image is its own little drawing or painting. You know, each, each little image in each story is, is totally its own little composition. And it has to be thought of that way, right? It has to be completely, you know, otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't work out. Otherwise it just is weak. So definitely um, the paintings and the visual narratives are sort of becoming almost interchangeable in some ways. Like I'll be thinking about, um, for instance, I did a couple of paintings of Wonder Woman and I was really interested in the concept of Wonder Woman and this, the, you know, the sort of icon of her and then the putting a self-portrait in her and kind of working with that. And then she kind of slid into um, a visual narrative I recently did on menopause and basically saying, you know, her that character, that image is becoming very um, 
you know, it's really sort of emblematic of where I am in my life right now. It feels almost that she's sort of taking over in some way. But the other thing is that um, I also, when I draw comics, I find that I, I somehow take those ideas and put them into paintings. Like this one of the raft right here started out as a comic without masks, people without masks on, and then COVID happened and I redrew them with masks on, and then I thought I really liked the composition, and so I started to put it and paint it in, into um, a big painting. So the whole thing, the, the comics and the drawings and the stories and the paintings are really becoming a whole thing at this point, which is exactly where I'm very happy that they are. And I realized that, um, particularly in the last six months during the COVID episode and the lockdown, there's been a lot of, um, I've done a lot of work during the COVID lockdown in terms of um, mask wearing and kind of, I did a project that a collaboration with three other women called As We Are, which is about sort of how we see each other in terms of self-portrait during the lockdown. I've done stories about um, sort of satirical look at fashions for spring with masks. Um, I've done a, a story about how the quarantine is kind of changing the human reaction to how we literally exist on the planet and how um, the skies got clear during the COVID lockdown. Traffic stopped going. Um, noise was less. You know, can we live in a world that's simpler, calmer, cleaner? Um, because it's we were forced to, right? And can we make that change permanent? So yeah, I go from my experience in the world, and lately I've been kind of incorporating um, larger issues like you know climate change and. Um, the COVID lockdown and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's, uh, it's all part of the whole thing. I, in a way I call it graphic journalism because you're really doing a narrative about, you know, how you are existing in this world and all this stuff going on. And, you know, we are just a tiny speck, but, um, but, you know, maybe one voice can help make some sort of difference somewhere. I just finished, I don't mean to go on here, but I just finished a um, story called The Reckoning, um, which was really depressing for me to write because it was about, you know, how we are, um, humans are really devastating the planet. I mean, we are really causing grave danger and um, in, in so many different ways. And the population, there's too many people, there's too, not enough resources. Um, I spent, I did spent the summer writing this story and it was totally depressing. And so my humor about it is sort of my way of, it's sort of being able to kind of somehow coexist with what happened by making, making things funny on some level. Um, and I kind of do that throughout my work all the time. I mean, there's always this sort of dark side to me, and then there's always a very kind of humorous side. And I think it's really my way of, um, you know, just kind of being able to process everything. But it's the truth. And so, you know, this stuff can kind of take over. I love I'm a dangerous, powerful, difficult, threatening, ungodly, badass menace to the status quo. And I like it. <laughs> hmm. I love it. I do too. I do too. Let's see. <laughs>